Okay, morning everyone. Everybody caffeinated? Everybody had their beer? If it's your first time at uh, Monktoberfest, pace yourself. When I attended the first time, I mean, I was hung over for a month. I just couldn't even look at beer. So um, one of the things that's very nice about this conference is that there are a lot of uh, really outstanding people here and uh, a very international flavor to it. And because we're close to the border, you know, Steve it was talking, he said, well, you know, there'll, there'll be a lot of outstanding Canadians in their field. And that idea, that appealed to me. So what I'm going to talk about is something a little bit different from uh, your classic uh, presentations. I'm going to talk about how to scale the machine that is your business. So uh, how many people here work for a uh, startup? Uh, it's up to you. And how many people here have created startups? You're entrepreneurs. So entrepreneurs are basically people who are unemployable in normal circumstances, right? That's, <laughs> that's what drives you to create new companies. And I've been a part of successful startups and some less successful, but I've, I've been able to grow some to 100 million revenues, billion dollar exits. And I get asked a lot about, well, okay, should we do this? Should we do that? At what point do we do these things? And basically questions about how do I scale the business? And uh, so I, as Steve mentioned, I was at MySQL, I was at Zendesk. Currently I'm at a uh, venture capital firm where I'm at what's called an executive in residence. It, it means basically I work with some of their portfolio companies. And I'm going to talk about how to scale the business. Uh, let's see, okay, nothing's happening. Okay, so how, uh, some of you are probably familiar with the uh, startup genome. There's some really interesting research that you can get from their uh, white paper. It's basically statistical analysis on startups and uh, why they fail. And it's sort of sobering when you see the stats on it that 90% of startups uh, fail because of self-destructive behavior. Meaning it's not a market issue, it's not a competition, it's basically things that they screwed up internally. And the biggest problem that, that causes these startups to fail is what's known as premature scaling which is basically spending more money than you actually have because you thought you were on this inflection curve and you were just badly mistaken. Uh, and usually it takes people a lot longer to get through each of these phases. Uh, so I'm gonna talk a little bit about these phases. In, in this report, they kind of talk about the phases of growth, uh, kind of a discovery phase, uh, validation and then eventually you get to the point where you scale and I've arbitrarily put some revenue numbers here and so I would say if, if you're under 10 million in revenue you're probably a startup if you're uh, over 100 million you're certainly not a startup anymore although you may have been once upon a time uh, so let's actually take a look at some of the ideas uh, and the first one is people use this term scale a lot and it means different things to different people to me, what scaling is really all about is very simple. It's can you make investments that grow your business, your revenue, faster than the expenses? And the key thing to think about is this is really an engineering problem. Or, or maybe if you put an engineering lens on this, it becomes a little bit easier to think about. And so you might consider like, what are the factors that limit your growth at any stage? And how do you figure out how to kind of move the needle and actually break through some of those limiting factors? If you actually know what's limiting your growth, you can do something about it. The hard part is often you're just trying lots of different things and you really don't know what's working and what's not working. So what I, what I really encourage people to do is, is be very data oriented uh, when you're doing this. And it's funny because in Silicon Valley there's certainly this obsession around startups. Uh, it's, it's, it's a long time thing. Um, but you can see companies that really get it wrong. Uh, this is from uh, Groupon's uh, revenues and expenses uh, from their uh, IPO filing. 
And if you look at it, you, you just kind of look at that and say, well, clearly this is not a, a good business. And yet they were raising public funds in order to do what? In order to make it bigger. But bigger meant you'd probably actually be losing more money for a long time. And you say, okay, well, Groupon's the exception. Uh, but then you can also see, well, uh, Zynga, uh, it's kind of the same thing. You've got a uh, revenue curve that is just, uh, or expense curve that's going to grow very rapidly. Uh, Pandora, Yelp. I mean, there are many, many companies that get this wrong. And of course, it's, it's, if you go back to your uh, college economics course, microeconomics, you remember how to optimize the revenue with the marginal utility cost, taking the differential area below the curve? No, no, no. <laughs> it's really, <laughs> it is not that complicated. <laughs> Scaling a business, there's two things to remember, profit and loss. And all you have to do is grow the revenues faster than the expenses, okay? Uh, and, and, and with that in mind, you can really have more of a rational business. If you're in the home, home run business and you're just trying to do an IPO and you're gonna leave somebody else holding the bag, that's a different uh, kind of thing. So let's actually take a look. Um, what I'm gonna do is look at a couple of different phases and try to give some uh, ideas and things to think about on how to scale the business. And the, 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 the key thing is there's different factors at every stage of the business. We'll look at product market fit, uh, what I call pattern prospecting, uh, some of the process improvements, people, and profit. So uh, to make things easy, it's the five Ps, because there's always five Ps in presentations, right? Mm -hmm. And uh, we can keep this interactive. So if, if uh, people have observations or you want to disagree, that would be fantastic because that will actually make it uh, a little bit more interesting for everyone. So the first phase is about product market fit. So if you, if you had, uh, uh, you're building uh, freeze-dried instant beer, uh, it's a mythical product, <laughs> but I was uh, sadly, sad to discover that there actually are freeze-dried beers. <laughs> You got to be pretty hard up for that, I guess. Uh, but it, maybe that solves the problem for, for people, uh, backpackers, uh, or when you do your white, wa white water rafting Oktoberfest trip, you want freeze dried beer. I don't know. Uh, the key thing at this early stage is before you get too far ahead of anything, you really have to understand the product market fit. And this comes down to one thing what is the problem you solve? And as technologists, we tend to put the technology first, and, and I meet entrepreneurs all the time, and they tell me all of the things their product does. And product could be service, could be SaaS, could be mobile. But at, at the end of the day, the only thing that matters is, is there a person who has a problem who would hire your product or service to solve that problem? So in other words, what is the job for which your product would be hired? And beyond that, it, it really doesn't matter. Now, there's a couple of key things during this phase. You, you've got to figure out who has the pain, and by who, like the, their, their title, what type of company they're in, you know, and, and then you have to understand, will they actually pay money to solve the problem? Because if nobody's paying you money to solve the problem, you could argue that there isn't maybe that much value to solving the problem. Or maybe it's a problem that everyone talks about, but nobody really is that motivated to solve. Uh, and then, you know, as, you, as you're in this phase, you want to think about how big is that market. Uh, the key thing during this early stage is, is, is the MVP or, you know, build that minimal viable product to see if there's really interest. And if you're, particularly if you're in a disruptive kind of business model, then the minimal viable product can be pretty darn minimal. You know, MySQL, uh, you know, 4.0, and, and there were versions before that, but I don't think it, there very many people really used it uh, before that. But it was a pretty minimal product in, in terms of database functionality. The key thing is you've got to get people into production using the product. And they've got to be really friggin' happy with it. They've got to be absolutely ecstatic and delighted with your product, not just paying you, but really happy about it. And then what you want to do in that stage is really understand how is it they're using it. 
And it may be that they're using your product in ways that you did not really anticipate. That's actually a good thing. But you want to be involved enough that you're really able to observe those things and see where people take your product and, and where, they saw, where they apply that technology. And it might be things that you just really did not anticipate. There's a couple of key things uh, I get asked a lot, which is, okay, well, what metrics should we pay attention to in different stages? And I would say in the early stages, it's really just basic kind of baseline metrics. What's your, your traffic, top of funnel traffic? Uh, if, you, if you have a product that requires a, a registration or a trial process, you want to measure those. You want to know how many customers you're getting, your average deal size. And then what I kind of say is the demographics of your users. So you can figure out who is actually using your product and why are they using it and, and to a certain extent where are they coming from. Classic mistake in early startups is they get things going, they hire a bunch of salespeople, and they really don't know why people buy their product, but they go ahead and hire salespeople, uh, assuming that the salespeople can get something happening. Don't do that. <laughs> don't hire salespeople until you actually know who really cares about your product, why they buy it, because otherwise, you, you know, you're going through this uh, very inefficient filter of uh, you have an understanding of the market and the problem, and then you're expecting somebody who maybe at best of cases doesn't have those skills, and they're going to go be able to communicate to somebody else to, to sell. It's not going to work. Other key thing is in the early stages, uh, a lot of people get really obsessed with their competition, and competition really doesn't matter that much. If you focus more on your customers and making them successful, then you, you don't have to be so reactive to, you know, what's the latest feature that the competition did and, and do I need to jump on that? Now, one of the things I, I, I did in this presentation is I've sort of tapped into some uh, brains of other people, uh, CEOs and founders of companies. And so I talked to uh, Scott over at uh, Atlassian. Um, his favorite beer, by the way, is Little Creatures, an Australian beer. I highly recommend it. Um, and he made the, the point that in the early days, you have so many short-term problems that you can just be scattershot across a whole bunch of different areas. But you've got to really keep in mind what is your long-term strategy so that you know where, which problems to actually focus on and which ones you're, you're basically just going to neglect. And in the early stages, you know, you want to hire generalists rather than specialists because when there's some problem that needs attention, you don't necessarily have a full-time blogger who's going to work on blogging. It's like, we need a blog? Okay. Who could go do that? And having people who are like, yeah, why not? I've never done that, but I can do that. Is there a question at the back? Yep. I really like this model. I think it actually works well for scaling your products and stuff in businesses as well. And you pay attention on investments. One of the challenges, I think, is attention between something you talked about earlier and something you talked about now. If you, we all imagine, please don't go back to it, the, the Zynga graph uh, of their revenues and expenses. There's a, it changes slope a bunch of times. And so one of the questions, there's a bunch of points in there where it looks like their business Spectacular, right? They're about to, you know, have zero cost in energy. Um, and so the measurement of those pieces and the time scale you choose is pretty challenging. And so I'm wondering what the what are the, the parameters that you would have people put on, you know, if we're making long-term investments or we're gonna suffer with some short-term problems, which can certainly be that the colors in your in your ledger are red instead of black for a while. Um, and where you say this is, you know, during this time frame you need to show these slopes at the right the right relation to each other. Well, you know, any business, you're in an investment mode for, for a period of time. And, um, you know, the key thing is just don't run out of money. And <laughs> the, 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 but the more insidious problem is if you are in investment mode for a long time, sometimes you create a culture that uh, really doesn't know anything else. And I actually think that many of the problems that high-flying startups have uh, when they're overly funded is that they've never actually made a discipline anywhere in the organization about how to make tough decisions and which things to fund and which things not to fund. So uh, if you have multiple product lines, then it becomes a little bit easier because you want to measure uh, your existing, you know, uh, 
uh, cash cows or growth, you know, steady businesses different from things that are in investment mode. And as companies get larger, you know, it totally makes sense to overinvest in new businesses and underinvest in the established ones. Where big companies go wrong is they do the exact opposite of that. So a classic would be uh, Sun Microsystems, which I had the pleasant fortune to work for for a couple of years. <laughs> so they, they acquired MySQL. And you look at it and say, well, boy, this is a, and there's some interesting tweets a couple of days ago about, you know, uh, would Linux have been as successful if Sun had not made so many blunders? <laughs> And it's like, no, Linux would have totally been successful, but it is, it is kind of amazing to consider the mistakes that, that Sun made in assessing the market. But it's because there's this classic mistake big companies make, which is uh, they tend to pay attention to their most profitable, uh, most uh, b biggest deal customers at the expense of hearing what is going on in nascent markets meaning the fact that commoditization was happening was something that Sun as a company was, was pretty tone deaf to. So what, what I would say is if you break things down into different businesses, that helps. Uh, but you, you really have to have that culture of uh, understanding investment and not just, you know, it's so easy in most companies. It's, it's, let's, let me put it this way. It's usually easier in most companies to hire more people than it is to remove people who are not performing. And if you have that dynamic, organizations only get bigger and less functional and less scalable over time because you've got a lot of dead wood in them. So I didn't really answer your question, but maybe some other things to think about. Okay. Uh, uh, but there's a good point that Scott made, which is almost every problem, when you get down to it, is a people problem. Either you've got the wrong people or the wrong skills. And at the end of the day, People drive your culture, and the culture that you have brings in more people. And so you've got to really make sure you're building a, a, what I consider a performance-oriented culture. So the next stage, which is uh, usually where a lot of companies spend a lot of time uh, and maybe don't pay enough attention to this, is, is what I call pattern prospecting. And the key thing in this phase is you, you probably have a product, you probably have an audience that likes your product, but the, the trick is to figure out who are the best prospects for your company? And if you think of, again, if you think of the business as a machine, it's a machine that takes inputs of, you know, raw leads or people interested in your product. Uh, you have product capabilities, you have marketing, you have sales to move them through this funnel. But you need to understand which groups actually convert the best and why do they convert better than others? And during this stage, what you really got to hone in on is the message of your positioning and what your product does so that when people come to your site or, you know, learn about your product, they understand quickly whether it's for them or not. And a mistake that a lot of people make is they try to make such broad claims that it sounds like it's good for everyone, which means, in fact, it's not compelling to anyone. And so what you really need is a very laser kind of narrow focus so that the people who are a good fit uh, for whatever it is you're, you're selling immediately see themselves in, in your, your website and in your marketing materials. During this stage, you have to do a lot of A-B testing uh, to, to really understand which things are going to work or not. And you should start doing... Uh, some automation of tasks, but to be honest, it's okay if there's a lot of scrambling behind the scenes and manual processes, because uh, automating too much tends to make a company very rigid, and, and it then becomes hard to move. But at the very least, you need to have a clear strategy at this point, and if, for those familiar with Clayton Christensen and the, the idea of uh, innovator's dilemma and disruption, like there's a big distinction between whether you have a uh, sustaining technology, which means better, faster, cheaper, or usually better, faster, or you have a disruptive technology, which means, and disruptive technology, like, you know, Linux didn't win because of technical superiority over Solaris. This is the exact opposite, right? MySQL didn't win 
or do as well as it did because it was superior technology. There's lots of databases better than MySQL. But it was disruptive, which meant it, it was able to expand the market and serve the underserved. And you have to know what, which side of that equation you are on, whether you're, you're building sustaining technology or disruptive. Um, as you go to this phase, the, the metrics that you want to think about are uh, how much time are people spending on your site? That's in, in indicative of, of interest. What's your bounce rate? That's how fast do they leave your site? Uh, if you have a bounce rate over 50%, you're probably not doing it very well. Uh, you need to be measuring your leads coming in and the cost of acquiring those customers. And that could be you know, Google AdWords expense or other things. Uh, the, the classic mistake uh, that people make here is they think they see a little bit of early traction and they say, okay, we're ready to scale. Let's hire 10 salespeople, let's hire 20. We gotta, you know, maybe you have investors and the investors want it to grow really fast and you feel this pressure. And you, sometimes people blame investors for this kind of thing, but you know, I've often seen uh, founders or CEOs who maybe just go out a little bit too aggressively. Um, you ha you're much better off going in a measured approach and trying things and then seeing which things actually work. And maybe another way to think about that is don't spend a lot of money until you can actually see that there's a positive return. You don't have to be super scientific about it, but you know, don't hire 10 salespeople until you've hired a couple and you can see that these guys are able to uh, hit their number. And, it, and it, in this early stage of pattern prospecting, things don't, this, this is really an investment mode. You don't have to be optimal at this stage. You don't have to have everything fully automated. Uh, but you want to make sure that when you spend money, there's some, some benefit to it. Okay, and then I got uh, uh, Brian Halligan, uh, CEO of HubSpot. He's a really cool guy. His favorite beer is uh, uh, Chimay, very heavy duty, <laughs> very serious drinking beer. Uh, but he, he has a, a good point, which is don't hire salespeople, uh, or hire salespeople in linear uh, uh, pace with the lead, the, your lead volume because you have to feed the salespeople leads and if you don't have the lead volume like having uh, Mr. Maytag man as a salesperson where he's just waiting for the phone is just not a very healthy thing. Uh, he's a big believer in, in what's known as inbound marketing and if you're doing a lot of outbound marketing meaning cold calling and buying lists and uh, expensive uh, Gartner reports and stuff like that, that is, that is not, uh, not, not a way to happiness. Uh, he wrote a book called Marketing Lessons from the Grateful Dead, which is a pretty uh, interesting uh, way to do things. So, uh, The next stage is uh, kind of where you start to get into process improvements. And there you can tell I'm Canadian because I said process, eh? Um, here you want to understand when people, like, why do people buy? And the converse of that is when you get people in your funnel, why do they pop out? What is it that caused somebody to not take the next step in doing a trial or signing up or, or, or clicking to pay or do your credit card? And, and what you need to understand is you've got a whole bunch of resources in your company and you probably have managers asking to spend more money in each area. And you need to think about, am I better off adding these new features to the product or hiring three more salespeople or spending more in Google AdWords or localizing my product to German, French, Italian, Spanish, whatever. And those are all trade-offs. And most people don't really know how to compare those things. But again, if you think of your business as a system, uh, you know, it's healthy to maybe look at those and say, well, these are all fungible resources. They're not, but as an exercise, it's a good way to, to think about things. Um, and the key here, the, the reason I have the mad scientist picture is you really have to have continuous experimentation here and the willingness to actually try out some things and then measure the results. And it's not just try out things, like if you can't measure the results, it's not really an experiment, right? So again, it's part of the discipline that you wanna create. 
at this stage, the conversation that, that you're trying to have between sales and marketing is about uh, marketing qualified leads and sales qualified leads. So uh, has anyone heard those terms, MQL and SQL, that's not a database? <laughs> so sales qualified leads. The idea is that marketing, uh, marketing qualified leads would be marketing leads that have some kind of a scoring threshold associated with them. And maybe you're using some tool like Marketo or Eloqua or equivalent or even a manual scoring system. And uh, that should be a pretty automated process. Sales uh, qualified leads or sales accepted leads means basically the salespeople get those leads and say, yeah, there's something here. And in Salesforce parlance, it's like, yeah, I've turned that into an opportunity. Because if they don't actually turn it into an opportunity, it's like, well, that, that one just wasn't really uh, all that valuable. And during this stage, what you want to create is the notion of closed loop reporting, which means you can actually measure from uh, a lead source, maybe Google AdWords spending or SEO spending, all the way to how much revenue did that campaign really produce? And this is usually a very hard thing to do. Uh, in my experience, um, nobody has like 10 years of, 10 years of uh, this kind of quant-oriented marketing experience because as a discipline, it hasn't been around that long. But you really have to have those skills. And in this stage, you have to also make sure that you don't have kind of or either organizational silos or data silos that present, prevent you from actually doing this analysis. And it's actually like a lot harder than you think to, to do this. But it's something that you can chip away at over time. And you also have to make sure that sales and marketing are really on the same side of the table on this. Because the classic, you know, rift I see in a lot of companies is you got marketing saying, well, we did our part. You know, it must be a sales execution issue. And the sales guys are like, we don't have any good leads. I don't know how you want me to sell this stuff. And you, you, again, you got to get this collaboration happening. Yep. You know, I've been through this cycle a few times and maybe it's just the sales people I've dealt with. How do, you, how do you encourage and incentivize sales people to participate in the data generation process? Because it seems like so many of them, they don't want to use Salesforce, they don't want to update it, they don't want to do anything like that to create the data to drive this process of improvement data. So how, do you have any recommendations on how you incentivize them in a way that, that gets you not only the data, but hopefully relatively high quality data? Yeah, um, I mean, salespeople may not want to use uh, uh, these systems, but like you have to. I mean, you you hire people and you say this is how we do it here, and you require it. But it, it's not that. I mean, sales is uh, sales is your your uh, troop level uh, movements, right? So you're not hiring salespeople for IQ. <laughs> so they're not the best salespeople I know are really good EQ. They're really good at connecting with people, but they're not typically very analytic. And so you wanna have some sales operations capabilities where you have that ana analysis, but the role that the salespeople play in this is uh, to get you the raw data. But you know, again, most salespeople, they're, they're, they're focused on, I mean, good salespeople are focused on closing the deals. They're not focused on your data, but your sales leadership, the management team should be quantitative oriented and they should be part of that equation. Yep. Uh, yeah. So it's a, it's a pretty big brush for the whole of the sales profession, but um, if you're talking about the startup piece, and you said earlier very wisely, you want to have generalists and you want to have people who are going to be able to follow you to a pivot. So it seems like you've got salespeople who can't do things that are essential, you believe are essential to your business or aren't willing to. You have the wrong salespeople. Okay. Maybe, maybe you're taking like a contractor workforce and you're doing like basically transactional work, but that seems like a really under leveraged investment for a startup with respect to the people who are your primary contact with the relationship that has all this data to extract. So I, I think that you would do your company a disservice. I mean, great the salespeople because they're not in the room, right? Um, <laughs> you would do your company a disservice to accept that salespeople are going to be inherently limited to performing those transactions based on like lunches and expenses. When they're part of the they're part of the core team, you should expect from them the same standard of from the business you would from your VP in here. Well, I'm not saying you, you you don't hold them to the same standards. I'm just saying that the tasks that the salespeople uh, again, I'm distinguishing between um, 
the, the broad bulk of sales, uh, individual contributors, and sales management here. So, do you say the same thing that, that you don't hire engineers for EQ at a startup? I mean, line engineers. We've already been management and engineering needs to care about people. Do you think that engineers need to have a balance of those things? Yeah, I think, I think in general it's good to have people who, who have a balance. How would you accept that? In, why would you accept that lack in the sales people? Like, so I don't mean for this to become a, uh, as polarized as maybe I've, I've, I've implied, but I'm just saying that you know the, the primary goal of the salespeople is not going to be data analysis. So if you have a, t a, a if, as an example at Zendesk, I built a sales organization of about, let's call it 80 people. Uh, there were probably two or three people at the senior level who were really good quant people and maybe a few elsewhere, and that was okay. But the vast majority of them were excellent at their job, which was helping us you know, understand uh, what was happening at customer level and uh, bringing uh, observations about how customers use the product and where we would be successful. But they weren't necessarily looking, looking at it from a uh, big pattern matching perspective. At the management level, I like that. If you can find it in people, yes, absolutely, it's great. I'm just trying to be real. I, I was, uh, I, I would say, I, I want to be realistic about what what salespeople are typically really good at. And if you find somebody who's good at both parts, absolutely, you should hire them. I don't know that that's a, a, a common trait, though. But maybe we, we can talk more at lunch on that point because uh, I, I sense uh, some some different opinions on this. Uh, other comments or, or okay, let's let's uh, jump ahead. I'm just going to add a meta level as somebody that's currently trying to scale a, a non-software business, and I'm not talking about Redmond. I'm talking about Shortage Works, uh, you know, the life of the parallel entrepreneur. Um, whether this stuff that you're talking about, I mean, I feel a bit like it's it's so. Oh yeah, if you're trying to scale a software business, this is what you need to know. And I'm kind of wondering whether these businesses are, these lessons are more general. Um, pro some of them probably are, but I think in the software industry, you, you have some particular uh, potential for rapid growth that makes it very interesting as a laboratory because you can do experimentation fairly rapidly when you're growing rapidly. But um, yeah, it could, could be applicable elsewhere, sure. Um, I'm going to take a slight sidetrack on one thing, which I think is really uh, important in, in probably any company, and that is to understand all the steps in the buying process. And, um, you know, sometimes, like, often I find it useful to just go through the entire process of doing the Google searches, seeing where it takes you, signing up, going through that trial process, and then seeing how many hurdles do I actually go through in that. And how many different competing messages or calls to action am I experiencing? And the reason I put the, the 39 steps picture is because at some point, you know, when I was at Zendesk, I, I would routinely do these trials. And then I counted up all the steps and all the things that we were, you know, landing pages with links on them. And I counted all of them. And it's like, wow, there's 39 different steps that we're asking. We're not asking them to go through all of them, but we're presenting all of them. And I thought, well, you know, we really only want them to do you know, three or four things, why are we confusing people with all of these options? And then you talk to people and they say, well, you know, those ones don't really matter. It's like, well, then why are we serving them up to people? And the, the key thing is, again, you, you need to think about this from a customer experience perspective rather than, well, we, we ask them which uh, geography they're in so we can assign it to a salesperson. Or we ask this question so that we can shunt them through our pro internal process. Instead, go at it from the, the customer perspective. And streamlining these interactions can make a huge difference in how many people come through the funnel. And sometimes very small changes can yield you know, significant 10, 20, 30, 50% uplifts in how, how that process works. 
Uh, and again, the key thing is everybody, ha you know, when you, when you talk about this in an organization, everybody has opinions, you know, engineering, marketing, sales, et cetera. Uh, but what you want to do is, is have enough data so that the data trumps whatever opinions you have. And trying things out and having data is, is the key to, to simplifying these steps. Uh, key point from uh, Martin Mikos, who was, uh, we, he was my boss at MySQL, now he runs a company called Eucalyptus. Velocity trumps everything. And this is maybe particularly true in high volume startup businesses, where the faster you can get somebody to the table, to signing an order, the better it is for your business. And it's amazing sometimes how we set up obstacles that get in the way of this. You know, classic one is that, uh, you know, uh, salespeople will sometimes say, well, we, we shouldn't put the details of enterprise pricing on the website. Why not? Well, because I want them to contact me. And then I'm going to figure out how much money they have, and then we'll figure out a price for them. It's like, okay, but now you've introduced friction into that process to, to purposefully slow it down in order to wring out more money. Um, I'm not sure, you know, that may be the right strategy, but it, it's going to cost you in terms of velocity. Again, sometimes that's from the customer side. They, their job is to buy things and create boring crap that you have to deal with in order to do business with them. I mean, certainly we see this with our clients. Admittedly, you know, analyst consulting is not the same as this, yep. but you actually don't have a choice. I mean, if we go to IBM and say, here is our standard pricing, they're like, that's really cool. Now let's have a negotiation. And they yes. have, you know, if you're selling to big companies, yeah, okay, you might be lucky and it's just one sales guy going bang, but if you're talking about big ticket items, they have procurement, they have all of this crap that they just have, they have to make a job of role for themselves. Yeah, it's frustrating. In fact, uh, there's one company that I think does an, an exceptional job in this area, and it's Atlassian. And Atlassian, it's like, you know, it doesn't matter who you are, you pay by credit card. And when Oracle wants to buy an order of Atlassian stuff, it's like they don't get terms, they don't get invoicing, they don't get to negotiate. It's like it goes on Gary Wizen's credit card, you know, and that's how it operates. I mean, salesforce.com, and in order to become a supplier, you have to send them a fax. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So my only point is your, your customers may inflict obstacles on, the, on this road. Try not to inflict too many the other way around because it, it does slow you down. So, so how do you increase the efficiency? And again, these are just some random ideas, uh, but it actually, what I want people to think about is that you actually have more influence over this than you might expect, which is, you know, how, how do you get higher ASPs? Well, you can g move upstream to higher markets that spend more money, okay? Everybody moves up to the enterprise at some stage. You can add more features that add more value. Uh, you can go to geographies where it's less price sensitivity. There's lots of things you can do. How do you increase the win rate? I, I would argue that uh, better segmentation lets you target customers better. Sometimes having great PR gives you a higher win rate because people know about your company before they start negotiating with you. Uh, there's a lot of different things here to, to think about. Uh, and again, I, I think sometimes about velocity, just being more transparent uh, and publishing, you know, about details about your company uh, and eliminating some of the questions that come up. Uh, I'm going to try to speed up here because I'm, I'm running over. Um, some input from uh, one of the guys I hired at Zendesk, uh, hired to run the uh, EMEA market, very quant-oriented guy. And one of the things that we did fairly early there was uh, having local support in local languages in different geographies. Even before we had a lot of people, we didn't necessarily have a presence in, in Germany, France, Italy, or Spain, but we did hire people who spoke uh, native, you know, from those regions, spoke those languages natively, enabled us to have kind of a footprint in those areas, and localized our product for those regions fairly early. Uh, and that's actually a, a, a much more cost-effective way of, of getting a presence in countries maybe before having, you know, a 10-person team, et cetera. Uh, one of the things it does also is if you localize your product early on, you, su you go through a lot of suffering, pulling the strings out, translating them, et cetera, but it makes it that much easier to, 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 do it to expand the scope later on. And if you 
create, uh, this goes back to the distributed uh, organizations, as soon as you create one remote group, it sort of forces your organization to get better about internal communications and being distributed. And that's a hard hurdle to get through. At MySQL, we actually did that really early on, way before I was there. Uh, but it, it meant that we were able to communicate in a distributed fashion pretty effectively. Um, during, during the next kind of growth area to think about, it's all about people. How do you increase your efficiency as you grow? And this is where you have to have a culture of uh, accountability. And really, to the extent that you, people in the organization understand who does what and who has responsibility. So if you say, well, you know, we have a goal of generating so many uh, sales qualified leads or marketing qualified leads. You, you want to be able to know who owns that number and who has responsibility for, for delivering it. Maybe there's multiple people involved, but having clear ownership is, is important. Typically, you also want to start to get towards more specialization in teams. That could be in the engineering side. It can also be on sales and marketing where you have focus on you know, new business versus expansion business versus renewals, OEM selling versus enterprise selling and other things. Uh, so you, go, you start to make that transition from generalist to specialist. Um, a very common problem as companies grow past a couple of hundred people is that the management actually starts to become a little bit of a, a, a limiting factor. Uh, and, if, and ultimately, if your people don't scale, your organization will not scale. You have to have people who can grow and can handle the job maybe more than the job that they're in. Um, we had a pretty clear rule at, uh, at uh, MySQL with a few exceptions and certainly at Zendesk, which is, you know, don't hire assholes. And, you know, we, we all recognize that when we say it and we, you know, nobody consciously tries to hire an asshole. But what I would say is sometimes organizations develop a, a uh, tolerance for prima donnas, uh, for, for, for behavior that isn't necessarily fitting with the team. And you observe it when you say, well, there's certain rules in the organization. And you say, well, how come that guy doesn't seem to follow the rules? Well, he's the only guy who wrote, can write the code in the kernel and understands how that happens. So, you know, we just, threw, or, you know, so-and-so, she closed the million-dollar deal, so, you know, we cut her some, and you have to be very careful as an organization. If you start kind of devaluing the values of, of what you talk about, because people in the organization take their cues from how you act rather than how you talk. And if you're not walking the walk and talking the talk, then the values and the culture, you know, they don't, they don't mean as much. Uh, you can address some of these issues by investing in training and helping to grow your organization, their management skills, but it's, it's a, a very dangerous thing if you, if you let that culture become uh, kind of insidious. Back. You know, I, think that's, I think this is an underappreciated thing that you say it's a checkbox item. Um, I think if you've never mixed a candidate, Purely because they were an asshole, you're probably hiring an asshole. Right? If you've never said this person perfect in every way except they don't make us more likely for the company you want to be or accept their asshole, then they're getting through your door. We need That's a Wilson right. in the room then, because he would argue that actually companies made of assholes can be very successful. That was the argument we had two years ago, I think. Look at Oracle. You want to Look at Oracle. <laughs> <laughs> You're an entrepreneur because you're unemployable. Don't hire assholes. What if you're the asshole? <laughs> and I think that happens uh, more often than you would expect, yes. Uh, there's a, maybe a corollary in another talk later on another year. It's like, don't work for assholes. But, uh, you know. If you're the asshole, what's the best way to keep yourself away from the staff so you don't? Well, no, I think it's all relative, right? I mean, if you've got a company full of assholes, then nobody thinks they're all assholes, right? <laughs> Yeah, but we, we have a uh, policy of the no asshole rule. And what ends up happening is, is like people don't want to question other people and everyone's just like hugging the entire fucking time instead of calling <laughs> somebody out on something that they're doing and like making a decision because they don't want to be an asshole and like forcing somebody's hand. And those two examples you gave, 
the, that's not those people's problems. That's poor management. Sure, yeah. In the end, it, it does come down to management. Um, but it's a balancing act, yeah, because I think to call somebody out on performance, that's, that's not being an asshole. Uh, it depends how you do it, I suppose, but uh, there's a balancing act. Another comment here. I mean, it's interesting, I mean, I think this is a checkbox, I think, right? I think the problem a lot of startups have is they don't get rid of assets. Yeah. Right? Is it, it's not so much like you don't always know going in if this guy is a rock star who just can't interact with humans particularly well, or if he's an asshole, right? But you find out over time. Usually you know pretty you know, fast, though. It yeah. depends. I mean, sometimes you just kind of, you, you sometimes you treat them. Right, um, you know, and they, they they turn into that role, and they're just special, or they're you know, or they're just not contributing anymore because they're burned out or whatever. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, I think it's a it's a good point that you have this. It, it becomes more in the firing than in the hiring, and I think where a lot of organizations get this wrong is that they'll just move somebody out quietly, and they'll say, well, they, they've left. And actually, the right way to say it is, well, you know that guy we hired, and he closed the million-dollar deal, and he wrote all the kernel code, and he did every, he wrote the website. Well, he's an asshole, or not even that. It's like he didn't work well with others, you know, and nobody liked working with the guy, and so he can't be here. Or, you know, one of our values is we take care of our customers, and he was, he just couldn't do that. Most states that you get sued for saying that. Up. <laughs> no, I, I think there's a way to say it. Not necessarily publicly. Mike? I was going to say, uh, I once worked for a company that was entirely populated by assholes and led by an asshole. It took me two years after I left that company to tell somebody, you are a fucking idiot in the middle of a meeting is actually considered culturally insensitive. <laughs> 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 it was a real interesting life experience. I wouldn't encourage people to try it, but it's, uh, it definitely shaped me in many ways, as you'll see in my talk tomorrow. Actually. <laughs> Okay, let, let's jump ahead. So actually, I got some uh, good I input here from uh, Aaron Levy over at Box. Uh, I don't think Aaron drinks. Uh, to be honest, I'm not sure he's old enough to drink. <laughs> no, no. Don't tweet that. Don't tweet that. Uh, but he made the point. Uh, they're really growing very rapidly. But he, he made the point of uh, hire people who can do the job two years from now because they're growing at such a fast pace and mix it up between, you know, experienced people who've done the job before and fresh thinking. And actually, I think that's a very cool idea because sometimes if you have, you know, if you have all people who've come from a certain viewpoint, it's really hard to get divergent views and you want to have those divergent views and think about different things. Yep. To flip it around to somebody who's, who's looking for work and recently dealt with a company where everybody I dealt with was a 20-something white male programmer. You know, like between 25 and 30, and no yep. difference, no women, no nobody was white. Nobody. That to me is a screaming warning sign of a, of a cultural failure, right? And and that's going to develop lots of assholes, right? Well, I'm not sure it develops assholes, but I would say a monoculture is really difficult because you don't get divergent opinions, and divergent opinions is where you get a lot of creative ideas. Uh, and, and if you have too much DNA from, from one particular source, like, you know, you see companies where they hired, you know, all kinds of people from one, one school, one, one company, and then and it's, you're surprised that, you know, their, their thinking wasn't creative. It's like, well, why would that be a surprise? So. It's like just this sort of insight, like, where the fuck did Aaron come from? He just like <laughs> exploded as this fully realized, I mean, you know, we're looking for talent. He, he, he hired. He hired professional tweeters. I mean, because I mean, his, his tweets are, <laughs> you know, like some of the he's funniest funny guys. Right? Yes, exactly. He's a very funny guy. He's a very he funny is. guy. Um, he, you know, he had a bit of a uh, education about going after the enterprise, and he really has studied it. Uh, he's a fascinating guy, though, and it's like you know, he he. He heard about the dot-com bubble, you know, that's the good news. He didn't necessarily live it, but, you know, he was in high school at the time, I guess. And, but he's a really, really smart guy uh, doing amazing stuff. Uh, another view, this is from Luke over at uh, Puppet Labs. 100-hour uh, weeks are a sign of failure, you know. And I think he, he lived this for a while, you know. He was a one-man shop, but he basically said, you know, if you're not, 
if, if, if everything depends on the CEO or the founder to make decisions, then you're probably not delegating enough or hiring the right people. Uh, and in a fast-growing company, you want to change things often enough so that people are used to this notion like stuff is always going to change. And at Zendesk, I used to basically tell people, like, look, every nine months, this is like a different company. So if you don't want to change, like you're in the wrong, if you're in a high-growth startup and you don't like change, like that's not a good environment to be in. Okay, second to last slide. Uh, there's this theoretical area of profits <laughs> for Silicon Valley companies. I don't know that it always exists. Uh, but the key thing here is how do you grow your margins? How do you continue to improve your, gr your margins while you're actually growing? And I actually think this is possible, but it is about continuing to eke out efficiencies every single stage. And, you know, during this stage, if you can have growth that is accelerating, and increase margins. Then you're on that path, the very rare path to do an IPO, which is pretty interesting. Uh, at this stage, the metrics that you have to look at are kind of public company metrics, and it's very sterile in how it works. You know, you're basically looking at uh, balance sheets and financial statements, et cetera. And the most important thing, there's two things at this stage that matter. One is you have to have highly predictable revenue forecasts because that's how you're valued on Wall Street. Uh, if you should go that path. And then the other thing is, though, every technology business will crest. They all grow, and then they all fade. And by the time you're on that downslope, if you haven't invested in the next new business, you're, you're Blackberry. Like, you are really in trouble at that stage because you've got a whole organization that is only used to doing one thing, and now you've been disrupted or the market has changed. And so the, 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 the pardon? The, the trick at that stage is to really think about planting early state, you know, you have to go back in time and have made investments earlier. So uh, my final thoughts, uh, scaling is really more of an art than a science, uh, but it's an art that can be learned and mastered. Uh, you have to treat it like a discipline, like the 10,000 hours, like any kind of creative discipline. The more time into it, the better you get at it. And mostly I think it's about creating a culture that values excellence in every single function. And so my comments about salespeople doesn't mean I don't value them. It means I value them in a very important way. Uh, and, and you want excellence in those areas. So if you, uh, if you want to reach me, uh, there's my contact info. If you want to see the slides, they're posted at bit.ly slash monkscale. And there's also some resources that I put up. Uh, it could be, it could be. <laughs> Uh, and then there's just some lists of some other resources I think are uh, helpful uh, if you're thinking about these issues. Okay, and I ran way long. Sorry, Steve.